Thank you. On behalf of Global Council for Science and the Environment, I am so pleased to welcome you to the second public facing roundtable related to the initiative Pathways Toward Accreditation for Sustainability and Sustainability Related Programs in Higher Education, using an approach that centers justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility. That is the full project title, and these aspects really are central to today's discussion as we look at how to make sustainability degrees better connected to sustainability jobs and climate jobs, and how to ensure that underrepresented students and communities have access to these skills and to these jobs that require new skill sets and competencies. I'm truly honored to lead this work. My name is Krista Heiser, and I'm the Senior Lead and Advisor for Sustainability Education at GCSE. I'm also a professor at Kapiolani Community College and served as the UH System Center for Sustainability across the curriculum at University of Hawaii System. I've taken a leave of absence to advance this work. Uh, my doctoral dissertation in educational administration uh, over 10 years ago was titled Sustainability, colon, students as stakeholders in the curriculum. And uh, I still believe that these programs are the cutting edge of higher education. And there are so many stakeholders in, in these sustainability degrees and certificates. Uh, this past summer, I attended a workshop on inclusive facilitation. And the wonderful facilitator, Sylvia Hadnot, she said something that really stuck with me. She said, a problem is like a campfire that we all sit around, and this is how we change the culture. I was like, wow, that's it. That's what this is, right? Uh, the problem we're talking about today is this sustainability skills gap. And um, we, we just hope to bring together some people from the workforce. These are employers. This means corporations, consulting firms, city and state government, federal agencies, entrepreneurial businesses, B Corps. There's a lot of hiring happening and a lot of climate hiring about to happen. So at GCSE, we just wanted to bring these two groups together and ask how we can better align. So please take a moment and introduce yourself in the chat so that we know who's here today. Here's what I hope will happen today. After I introduce our facilitators and our panelists, I'll give a brief overview of our accreditation initiative. Then we'll hear a few, a few big ideas from our panelists and then have some time to talk. You'll be able to choose which panelist you want to be in a room with. I guarantee they will all be great. And at the top of the hour, we'll reconvene here in the main room for some Q&A and some next steps. And yes, a recording, the slides, and a meeting summary will be sent to everyone who registered today. So thank you so much again for being here. Uh, from GCSE, um, I'm grateful to Alex Ramey, our program associate, for helping to organize today's panel, and to Shelly Kosak for being here today. Um, we also have a few other uh, members of our team here today. And from our scholars team, we have uh, Katja Brungers. I don't know if you can see everybody right now. Katja Brungers and Jordan King, Ryan Johnson, April Deckert, and Rod Parnell uh, are with us today and tomorrow. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that even though we're all meeting on Zoom, each of us is in a place. And that place has a history with Native and Indigenous peoples. Every university and every employer has a complex relationship to the Native and Indigenous peoples of your place. I like this website because it can tell you more about whose lands you are on. And it's so important to know that, to know how those lands were acquired and what, and what actions you or your organization can take toward healing. I'd like, to, I'd like us to take a moment for this. And if there is any land or peoples you'd like to acknowledge today, uh, you can also do that in the chat or just inside yourself. Take a moment, look outside. For me, it's dark still, but maybe where you are, you can look outside and see a tree. 
think about water and not just why we're here, but where we are here from. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tom Richard, Chair of the GCSE Board of Directors. Tom? Thanks, Krista. And it's my pleasure to welcome you also. Um, the, the Global Council for Science and the Environment is um, working towards uh, being more inclusive, and we have an oath to be anti-racist and inclusive through sustained learning, action, and accountability, which I'd like to read now. The Global Council for Science and the Environment acknowledges that regardless of one's own race or ethnicity, individuals are at various points along an anti-racist journey. As an organization committed to becoming anti-racist and multicultural, GCSE will purposefully work to identify, discuss, and challenge issues of race, color, ethnicity, orientation, and the impacts they have on GCSE, its mission, its partner organization, and its people. We accept this challenge as our continuous journey. We explicitly and publicly affirm our identity as an anti-racist multicultural organization. We resolve to develop and work to implement strategies to dismantle racism within all aspects of our organization and society. We commit to recognize, address, and oppose all forms of racism, injustice, oppression, intolerance, and hate. Thanks, Krista. And thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Tom. And thank you for all your hard work as uh, the GCSE chair of the board of directors. It's a pleasure. Um, I want to tell you just a little bit about our initiative pathways toward accreditation for sustainability and sustainability related degree programs. There are five elements of the program. The first is inclusive participation and stakeholder input. That's what we're doing today with this series of roundtables um, with different stakeholders in this work. Uh, other forms of participation include monthly community of practice meetings, uh, regular communication on our website, and working with our truly awesome Sustainability Leadership Advisory Council, uh, several of whom are here today, and I want to thank them for being here as well. Uh, we have a really important um, publication uh, and research project open right now, and that is a proposal statement related to key competencies in sustainability education. This is to um, assess convergence at, around eight interrelated competencies in sustainability. And we'll tell you at the end of the um, round table this morning how you can participate in that research. We're also designing professional resources for program directors and faculty so that um, they can design and evaluate their programs um, and evolve these programs. And then of course, we will design best practices and standards around program level accreditation. And I'm especially excited that the president of the Council for Higher Education Accreditation, Dr. Cynthia Jackson Hammond is with us today and will be our last speaker on the panel today. All of this work, is centered in justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility in order to evolve the field. Uh, as I've mentioned, there's many stakeholders in this work. I, I would love to include a picture here of all of us planting trees on campus or doing something cool like that. But let's face it, this is work that involves spreadsheets and tables and a whole lot of Zoom meetings and conversations. That's the only way I know to do this work. This is the kind of work that we do. So, you know, let's do it in a good way. The big question that we're talking about today is how do we create better alignment between what sustainability professionals do and the design of sustainability education programs and their evaluation? 
And again, we're just bringing together two stakeholders, sustainability programs in higher education and employers of sustainability professionals and graduates of these programs. You know, these programs are still pretty new. So some of the people that um, will be speaking today um, have been doing this work for a long time, um, but the degrees didn't exist when they started. Uh, and we can learn from that. And then some of our speakers have are graduates of sustainability programs um, and can talk about how that prepared them or didn't for the work that they're doing now. So um, with no further ado, oops, we want to um, introduce you to our panelists, which I promise I had all ready to go. Oh, here they are. <laughs> Um, our first panelist, maybe you guys can just wave. I'm just going to... Hi, can I get a uh, multi-grain bagel with egg and bacon, but no cheese? Thank you. I'll have one of those multi-grain bagels, too. <laughs> um, our first speaker will be uh, Dr. Megan Chapel. Megan is a vice president for sustainability at Georgetown University at Washington, D.C., uh, and we just put a one sentence bio for each of our speakers. These are on our website and um, maybe Alex can put this link in the chat as well. You can also see who the speakers will be tomorrow. Our second speaker will be Brayden Kay. Brayden is the Sustainability and Resilience Director for the city of Tempe, Arizona. Alex Slaymaker is a project manager and consultant at Black and Veatch. Becky Lakin uh, is corporate citizen, citizenship strategist and storyteller. What a great title at The Giving Wall um, in the nonprofit sector. Bruno Sarda is a partner and principal for climate change and sustainability services at Ernst & Young, EY in Arizona. And Cynthia Jackson Hammond, as I mentioned, is a president of the Council for Higher Education Accreditation, CHIA. CHIA accredits the accreditor and, and she's based in Washington, DC. So again, thank you so much to all our panelists. And um, with that, let's get started. Krista, do you want me to kick off? Uh, yes, I was just bringing up my other notes to oh, okay. introduce you. No problem. Um, I wasn't sure if that was the cue or not. <laughs> uh, well, Megan, um, you know, everybody is talking about this sustainability skills gap, and I know you've worked in all aspects of uh, higher ed and sustainability. So I, I really did just want you to open this up and talk about why is this issue? What is this about? And how can we get these spheres to better align? Thanks. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's still morning. I had to double check well, where I am. It's still morning. Um, it's great to be here. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation. This is a conversation that has been going on for quite some time over decades. And I'm loving where this is evolving and how the the current um, approach that GCSE has pulled together from all the input, I think is really taking us in a direction that is rich and reflective of the needs we have for this field. My background, just to give um, a quick synopsis of that is working as a sustainability change agent, I guess would be the best way to say that in various sectors. So I've worked in community development, doing sustainability work, um, sustainable development work, I have worked in the NGO sector with large global NGOs, including World Resources Institute and the Nature Conservancy. I have also worked in the corporate sector. So I worked as a strategy consultant for sustainability, John Elkington's firm with clients like Ford and Nike and Walmart, um, McDonald's, other big names you've heard of. And I've also worked in the higher education sector at GW and now at Georgetown. And my role is a new role. So I'm also have the opportunity to sort of experiment with this kind of role in the field. Most universities have directors of sustainability and Georgetown has created a vice president of sustainability. So we're figuring out what that means um, at an, an executive level, level within an institution. So the skills that I've had to bring to bear are across all disciplines. I have a science degree, a business degree and a policy degree. Um, and 
they have all come, <laughs> have all come in handy. But sustainability means so many things to people. And I think that's the hard part about this is how do we pin it down? And we can find solutions that are related to technology. We can find solutions that are related to nature. We can find solutions that are re related to how we as humans interact and behave. So there's lots of different ways we can apply these skills. So it's really hard to pin down. But I think a good starting point is to reflect on the UN report that came out just yesterday marking 2030 as a date by which we have a lot of work to do and in fact requiring immediate massive change in order to avoid the worst impacts of climate change on our planet. And most people around this Zoom table know what those worst impacts are, but just to put a fine point on it, the worst impacts of disease increasing, not being able to grow our food in the middle of our continents, not being able to live on the edges of our continents because they're underwater. So there's so many things that are very dire that we're facing. And when we look at that, it's a really important to be mindful of the emotions. It feels daunting. It feels overwhelming. It feels depressing. And I'm laughing in order to lighten it for myself here, not because I'm, I'm taking it lightly. Um, and it leads us to think about what can I do as an individual? And that can feel powerless. And so we really need to think about collective action and systems change. So this requires systems analysis, looking at the overall system and finding the most effective solutions and the levers for change within that technology, nature, and human sectors. And it also means developing solutions with people who are affected by the outcome, which also requires different skills. And that means if you are in a majoritized population, bringing empathy and humility and listening skills to your work. And if you are in a marginalized community, that means finding ways to claim your power. And so this leads us to think about what are all the skills professionals need to address problems like the 2030 deadline, quite literally deadline. Um, we need to be able to imagine different futures. We need to be able to inspire one another. These are the emotional skills. We need to be able to work across functions, whether it's business planning, scientific analysis, data analysis. We really need to work across those functions. And we need to um, think about how what the power differentials are, who's in power, who has power, who has voice, who doesn't, because we want to bring those to the table. And again, we want to be able to look at systems. So I hope that gives us a start to this conversation and I look forward to learning from all of you. Back to you, Krista. Thank you, Megan, for those powerful and insightful comments. I really appreciate you. Um, next, I'd like to talk with Brayden Kay. So Brayden, um, in our thinking about accreditation, we're, we're basing our, our conversations around the key competencies framework, which we think is essential for sustainability work. I know you're familiar with these competencies and I wonder if you could just break, break it down a little further for us, um, especially when you are hiring in the work that you do, what do candidates need to know and understand and do in your line of work? Awesome. Thank, thank you so much, Kristen, and so great uh, to be here. So uh, I am a product of the School of Sustainability at Arizona State University, uh, got my PhD there in 2012, and then have been in municipal sustainability basically since then, uh, City of Orlando, and then founded the Office of Sustainability and Resilience here uh, in Tempe, Arizona, uh, almost seven years ago. Um, and then while in grad school and, and since have worked with Dr. Katya Brunders, Dr. Arnim Week, and, and many others at ASU around the sustainability uh, competencies. So I designed my PhD work around the competencies, specifically uh, going in depth on strategic competency, uh, strategic thinking, uh, and then have been trying to incorporate those competencies into how we run our office and also who we hire and, and how we develop pro professional development programs for our employees. So for example, let me give you a perfect example of the gap. I'm part of the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, 240 communities that have someone like me in their city. We predominantly do action plans, right? We try to figure out what are the things that we need to do to decarbonize? What are the things that we need to do to prepare for the climate change that's already happening and will happen? 
and we create climate action plans. Um, they have different names, <laughs> decarbonization plans, you know, resilience plans. Um, but what we find is that the students that we're hiring spend very, very little time in their curriculum actually creating action plans, understanding how to work with stakeholders on creating those plans, understanding on how to prioritize actions, understanding on the, the system's connections between different actions. There is a huge gap between when you come out of a sustainability program and then your ability to execute an action uh, plan. Uh, next speaker is Alex Slaymaker, who I've had the opportunity to work with. When she was at ASU, we collaborated on a urban forestry uh, master plan, which was an action plan. She is an example of very few students that get to have that kind of on the ground stakeholder engagement example of creating an action plan. I would say even at the School of Sustainability, maybe 10% at most have in their master's program an ability to actually create an action plan. And it's certainly not happening in, in, in my opinion, enough classes. And you can go down the line in terms of some additional competencies. The values competency, I think, is huge, especially when we talk about dealing with contested issues. I think we have a a crisis in our field where a lot of the engagement that we're doing are with the people that want to be engaged with and in the political spectrum of who's willing to have um, civil conversations about the decisions that need to be made. And there's a, there's a much broader span of people. We're starting to think about this a lot, understanding that the work we do in our city only goes so far. We really need to be having those conversations regionally and statewide, which means those are no, those are not blueberry and tomato soup conversations, which what we call places like Tempe in a place like Arizona. These are really, you know, purple carrot conversations where you're having to deal with a broad span of people who have very different values and trying to get them aligned on key investments moving forward. So those value pieces are huge. Uh, another thing to to raise in that value space is, and it was a, certainly a shortcoming in my education, sustainability education, was really centering and respecting and working with indigenous perspectives. And so I, that's, there's been some improvement in that space. And I, I've been lucky enough to have collaborators at ASU that have really been helping us push that agenda of bringing in more indigenous voices and perspectives into our work. But there's a long way um, to go. So those are just uh, a few of the examples of how, how the competencies show up in our workplace and what some of those uh, gaps are. Thank you so much for having me. Braden, that really, um kind of brings alive some of the competency language around implementation competency. And um, you mentioned the values thinking competency, um, building on what Megan said first about, about empathy and, and the emotional side of things. So I really appreciate that, um, kind of bringing that alive for me um, from that key competencies proposal statement. Uh, so next, we'll turn it over to Alex Slaymaker. Um, and Alex, if you can just um, share any thoughts about uh, the local nonprofit side of sustainability work where you have, have worked and now being in more corporate sustainability consulting, um, what differences have you noticed in these two sectors? Yeah, happy to share. Thanks, Krista. And hello, everyone. I, I totally agree with everything that's been said so far, and I'm really excited to be on this roundtable with so many great people. In my career, I've had the privilege of working for universities, nonprofits, public sector, and the private sector, leading a variety of sustainability projects all over the world. Um, currently, I'm at a global sustainable infrastructure company called Black and & Veatch, and I leverage expertise and skills really from across the entire company to deliver value for clients. Specifically, I'm focused on transportation electrification strategy consulting projects currently. And in my role, I design my project teams and I play a key role in hiring decisions. And I'm also just personally a huge advocate for workforce development in our space and making sure the next generation and the existing workforce is prepared to get done the massive amount of work we have to do. Um, so to your question, Krista, I'd say, you know, the most substantial differences I've observed working at different organizations, 
really really to three different things that aren't related to sector specifically. Um, so you have culture, size, and then the financial health of an organization. I think these different characteristics really impact the constraints that you're working against and the resources that you're really working with, which can impact the skills required for success. Um, but overall, I actually believe the skills needed to be a successful change agent in our space they're actually quite comparable across sectors, in my experience, as long as the roles themselves are similar. Um, you know, as everyone on this call knows, the, the workforce, our sustainability workforce really re requires that multidisciplinary skill set that combines such a huge wide range of skills. You've already heard people talk about today. Um, there are so many vital skills to consider. The list is really quite long and I think the literature on the eight sustainability key competencies actually offers a super helpful framework to understand this very multifaceted topic and make sense of it, both for you know folks in higher ed and for people in the professional space hiring uh, talent that, that's being graduated. Um, in practice, when I'm making these hiring decisions, I'm really looking for candidates that you know are passionate about the work, of course, have that foundational knowledge related to the topic of focus. But beyond that, I'm looking for people who can tell a compelling story in writing and presentations, who are comfortable with great amounts of uncertainty and are fast learners. Of course, like we've talked about already today, people who are committed to practicing justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, and, and everything they do every day, right? And being committed to that journey. Um, but then also folks who can jump in to a variety of activities that maybe they've never done before and deliver those quality results really quickly. In my experience, you know, people really develop this skill set through hands on experience. Uh, most people feel confident they can deliver in the really complex, uncertain and dynamic environments that we all find ourselves in because they've done it before not because they've read about it or learned about it, you know, in a class, in a theoretical sense. Um, personally, if someone lacks hands-on experience, I won't even interview them, um, just to kind of put it bluntly. Um, and in, in my view, really helping students understand the importance of that hands-on experience and then helping make opportunities actually available to them is a critical responsibility of higher education. Brayden hit on this already. You know, I did have the privilege of being able to participate in some really empowering applied opportunities, both in undergrad, undergrad and grad school. And I think that's the reason I am where I am today. And I would love to see everyone have that uh, opportunity and that, that privilege to be able to participate and get that experience. Um, and that's actually one of the major reasons I picked Arizona State for my master's program in sustainable solutions back in 2014, because they have such an applied uh, curriculum and my thesis was applied and they just have an overall multidisciplinary, you know, culture of innovation, which was really attractive. So um, just to kind of wrap up, I'm, I'm excited for the discussion. I'm really excited uh, to hear from everyone and what they're up to at, at the different universities and how you're designing educational experiences to really, you know, empower this next generation of, of talent. Thanks, Krista. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I really hope everybody from the higher ed side um, can take what you said. Without real world experience, I won't even interview them, you know, and what you're saying about uh, how to more consistently integrate, you know, community engagement can be real world experience, internships, um, engaged research. That's, you know, some of the language that we use around how to do that and how to do that better uh, so that our students and graduates could get interviews. <laughs> so thank you so much. That was great. Um, uh, uh, my next question is going to be for uh, Becky Lakin. Um, so Becky, you're in the nonprofit sector, and you work on the HR side. So mm -hmm. one thing that we think um, an accreditation could do is really communicate to an employer a better picture of what kind of skill set a sustainability graduates has. So, um, you know, like what Alex said about really looking for that real world experience uh, on the nonprofit side, what is it that you're looking for in candidates when you're hiring? 
Yeah, thanks for asking. And thanks for all of the contributions from all of you so far. It's They've been really insightful. And in many cases, they feel very validating. I feel kind of seen. So thank you for that too. Um, so I'm in nonprofits. I'm also in community organizations, but I've also been in, in corporations as large as 80, 90,000 people in 110 countries leading this topic and, and topics around equity. And so- mm -hmm. Um, and all and it, within all of those, I've been in human resources. Prior to that, I was in marketing, which is actually important for some of what we're sharing here because the storytelling component is so critical. I, I, one of the things I would advocate for the people on this call to do is double down on storytelling. Double like in your curriculum, double down. Don't underestimate the power of the confluence and combination of marketing and also that kind of, or you can call it what you want, creative communications, whatever, and the um, and the practical side of the work. Heck, bring in those teams inside your school, have them teach, do the work, bring in past graduates. The storytelling is critical. Um, and, and that's why I've actually found success in the work of sustainability within corporate citizenship, within HR. Don't ask, it's been a little confusing, but we've made it work. Um, but in the past few years, I found myself much more in an HR executive space, which has led me to a lot of recruiting conversations around talent. A couple of things I want to mention, I'll be as brief as I can. It's Brevity is not my strength. So you're welcome to also interrupt me. And for those who've been in class with me before, you know, that's totally true. Um, so a couple of things, when I think about what we're looking for, one of the things that I'm looking for as an HR executive are the competencies that are hard to teach. And that typically involves an emotional competency. And so, you know, a, a word that comes to mind for me in this conversation is partnership. What we're talking about right now is obviously really focused on the education system to prepare people to come into the workforce and to create and to do the most good, let's say, to create the most impact. I say do the most good. Um, but what we're not talking about is the other side of that coin, which is that the organizations are ready to take those individuals and create a culture and an environment in which they can do the most good. And we are not there. So there is there is an onus on the educational institution. There is an onus on the organization to say, we welcome this. We see this. We believe this. And by the way, this isn't just male dominated leadership lip service, frankly, right, which is so much of what I've experienced. Yeah, yeah, we want this. We want this. We want this. Oh, wait, I didn't want that. I just wanted something a little lighter, a little more like watered down, something a little more friendly and fun, something we could market and sell and tell. That's what I wanted, you know? So, so the, so two things. One, I think the things we can't teach are your competencies that are focused on interpersonal and intrapersonal. We can teach them, but they're not as easy. They're not like the strategic competency, um, or the implementation competency, right? There are methodologies, there are models, there are steps one can take. It requires a type of systems thinking, problem-led leadership indeed, but that interpersonal and the interpersonal are like, how do we help guide people toward and through that? Because that is hard. And when they're delivered into the workplace, it's really hard for us in HR to spend the time with them to be able to strengthen those particular skills. It just is. Um, and I want to dive down into the intrapersonal because I think this is something that is often under discussed. And I want to mention this too. When we look at the intrapersonal, what I also think we should consider is how do I create within you an emotional resilience, an intellectual resilience that allows you to do work motivated by, by your fear? Why are you all in this work? You're afraid. You're afraid for your families. You're afraid for your loved ones. You're afraid for the future. You're, you're not necessarily afraid for you as much as you're afraid for everyone beyond you. And, and so then to be, to be partners and friends with that fear and to make your way through a decades of, of career, trying to motivate people through and toward it and in it and toward action, it's a lot for you, right? So I think I think we're underselling and telling to the emotional requirements of our education institutions to upskill the resilience in the people who are getting ready to leave. Okay, so that's one. Second thing, which I've already mentioned, but I want to get more precise on, um, is the partnership with with organizations. So if we're thinking as if we're looking at the system, then we're saying we are going to deliver people into a company. And then we have to ask, 
is the company ready to have that person delivered? And they are not ready for that person to be in that company. And that person might be an N of one, maybe an N of two. They're pushing a boulder up a hill. And what I have come to find is that when you are up to, let me say this differently, when you're calling us to change the world and you're confronted pe with people who only want to change the game, they feel in insecure in your presence. When you are up to changing the world and they're thinking in a reductionist way, they feel reduced by your presence. And so when you're in there with your system thinking and your problem solving and your and 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 within a topic that is fear-based for everyone, they have a hard time not only thinking in the way that you think, but feeling in the way that you feel. And so I, I think one of the questions for me that has to come up is. What is HR's responsibility, not just HR, what are executive leadership, senior leadership's responsibility in creating these, these cultures that allow for these people to feel empowered and enlivened and possible and for them to make progress? And so, so on the HR side, that it's a lot of what I'm thinking about is to meet you, meet you and all the work you're doing as education institutions and build an environment in which that's that's possible. And I think, I think that we can, but we've got to, we've got to really wrestle with the emotional side of this work on and, and with the students and with the organizations. Does that make sense? I hope in some way. Yes. Thank okay. you. So That's much. all I've got. Yeah. Wow. Double <laughs> yeah. down on storytelling. That um, is re really powerfully said. Um, thank you so much, Becky. Of course, yeah. Thanks for having um, me. I'm going to uh, move on to Bruno Sarda. Um, Bruno, my understanding is that um, most of the big four consulting firms um, have announced, announced really ambitious hiring goals in the next few years around ESG, and a lot of sustainability professionals will be added to your ranks. I've heard numbers like 100,000 jobs in this area. With so much hiring anticipated, um, could you just give me a quick sense of the types of skills and roles and positions that will need to be filmed at be, be filled at your firm and others? Sure. Well, thanks. And yeah, great conversation so far. Um, and just, you know, by quick way of background, uh, uh, you know, I've been a chief sustainability officer, you know, hiring and building programs and teams, you know, I've led a, a large uh, climate related nonprofit, you know, CDP, that was actually a great incubator for talent that then, you know, often gets hired by firms like mine now or other corporates. Um, and, uh, and at EY, yeah, I help lead our, uh, we're the, technically the largest sustainability consulting firm in the world within one of the largest companies in the world, you know, nearly 400,000 employees. Um, and then, you know, teaching over a decade now at Arizona State as a professor of practice around things like preparedness, how to prepare for career success and sustainability and sustainability leadership and things as broad as fundamentals of ESG and as narrow as how to achieve a sustainable energy transition. I start with that because, you know, um, there is a wide range of skills needed. Uh, you know, this is, this is by definitely a, a symphonic orchestra, team sport, whatever you want to call it. And we need all kinds of people. For example, uh, you know, at EY, we say sustainability is everybody's business. Uh, and, you know, of course, we are focused on business. We do work with, with government as well. But, um, you know, I believe, you know, money makes the world go round and, and sustainable change, the, the kind of change we want, won't happen until it's funded, until it's financed. And, um, and that kind of unlocking of capital at scale it happens through the work of people who are really good with, you know, building strong business cases, doing, you know, detailed financial accounting, doing risk modeling and analysis. So, you know, in places like EY and other uh, big four, you know, we have obviously big uh, uh, accounting and audit and assurance type practices. And we hire people who are good at that, you know, and, and you know, I've been working, for example, with the School of Accountancy at Arizona State, who understands that now they can't graduate people out of accounting programs without firm and solid understanding of things like, you know, ESG and uh, 
sustainable finance and soon probably things like natural capital accounting and valuation uh, and, and you know, climate, uh, climate risk analysis, those kinds of things, because all of that goes into financial analysis. We then have things like, you know, tax, for example, you know, tax is another one of those things that kind of sometimes isn't uh, super sexy, but so many of the mechanisms that uh, the world's uh, governments and, you know, municipalities and states are employing to try to spur a uh, sustainable transformation is actually through tax-based bottling incentives, credits, uh, rebates, and so on. So there's actually a lot of work that's happening in the tax space of so people who are good at that and who need. Um, and the, the reason I mentioned that is I think when we think through that educational lens, uh, that it's not like we need to crank out just sustainability experts. We need to attach sustainability understanding and expertise to everything. And we need sustainability experts who themselves will need a little bit of everything else. Like, you know, all of those, you know, and, I, and I've seen, you know, Braden and Alex and others, uh, you know, uh, through the years uh, in, in their, you know, um, building out their careers and through their education and seeing kind of, again, this, this kind of very foraging type of, of approach of, you know, oh, I, I got, I got to get some of that and I got to get some of that and I got some, you know, and then by the time you're in a room, you can have a conversation with almost anybody in any part of the organization. When I was a chief sustainability officer for an energy company, my CEO once told me, he's like, I think you're the only guy other than me in this company who looks at everything. And I think that is true, you know, sustainability, everybody's business, and it touches everything. And so, you know, we look for that. Uh, but when we hire, of course, is we start from, you know, what is the role? So, you know, if we're hiring for a climate risk model, or well, what's for somebody who probably has, you know, either a PhD or some, you know, some strong education in that, and then we'll try to augment it. We do a lot of our own education, actually EY co-developed uh, a, a, an actually an accredited master's in sustainability that is available for free to any EY employee. So anybody who works at EY can pursue that level of education, no matter what their role. But you know, you start somewhere and the role itself will have a job description. So some will be very specific sustainability related roles. Others will be again in audit and tax and transactions and something, but we're always also gonna favor, not always require, but favor that exposure to kind of ESG and sustainability. So uh, I know it's, it's a rich topic. I'll, I'll leave it there and, and happy to continue the conversation. Thank you, Bruno. I can't believe um, what you said about accounting. You know, it it went from, from ideas like this being so unusual or radical even in accounting departments, in economics departments, you know, in higher ed. And now it's truly part of the curriculum and needs to be part of the curriculum. That's um, really what I heard you say. Um, so thank you so much for those insights from that side of accounting, um, which you know I have no experience <laughs> as an accountant and uh, I did do my taxes, but um, thank you so much. That was uh, very, very insightful. And um, our last panelist today uh, is, Dr. Cynthia Jackson Hammond, and um, I'll just open it up to whatever you have to add. Um, Alex and I went to the CHIA conference this year, and I was just so excited by what I heard and by some of your insights on just sort of the broad field of higher education and how we're preparing um, people for the future. But thank you so very much for uh, engaging me in this roundtable. And I just get so excited when I hear all of the roundtable panelists. I I feel like I I I want to step back in time and say, why didn't I do this in college? You know, but I had a, a wonderful opportunity as a college president uh, of a land grant institution. And if you know anything about 1860 or 1890 land grant institution is all about engaging the communities uh, of practice, the communities of scholars, the communities uh, of, lo of locations to solve community problems. And this is very, very reminiscent of the kinds of work that the water resource management program at uh, my previous institution used to engage, finding the problem and then looking at it from all different perspectives, 
with a variety of people. So sustainability is just such a critical part of how we prepare students today. Uh, I do hope that this becomes very, very prevalent in most institutions, either through service learning or through engaged learning or through practice. Um, the Council for Higher Education accreditation is probably way in the background of, of what people understand about accreditation. So I want to give you a little, a little information. Uh, CHIA is the only non-governmental organization that provides recognition for accreditors. And what that simply means is that we provide sort of a gold standard for accreditors when they go in to review institutions and programs. There are 24 very rigorous standards that accreditors have to meet in order to get that recognition. And that recognition once given is for seven years, but there are interim uh, uh, reports and interim reviews uh, before the seven year cycle, cycle ends just to make sure that the accrediting agency is following all of the guidelines prescribed for them to be a very um, uh, practical but ambitious kind of practice with institutions. Uh, we don't go into the institution uh, to accredit programs, but we accredit the accreditor who goes into the institution. And this is very, very important. We have over uh, 7,000 uh, recognized um, uh, uh, accredited institution in the United States. So we have regional accreditors as well as program accreditors. And what we know about program accreditors as well as regional is that we want to make sure that the students are getting the competencies and the experiences and the opportunities to be successful based on the promises that were given to them by the university or by the program. CHIA conducts research. We serve as a national advocate for institutional, um, uh, for institutional autonomy. In other words, we believe that it's the institution that sets the academic standards and not the federal government. So we really wanna make sure that um, as an advocate for institutions, they have uh, an input, they have a say as to what is important in their institutions. Uh, as I mentioned, when a crediting program is awarded, uh, the recognition is for seven years. It's interesting that the sustainability competencies comport very well with two of CHIA's newest standards, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that must be manifested by the accreditor, as well as how are you encouraging support for DEI within the institution? But you have to start with yourself. You have to start with the accrediting organization. You can't ask the institution to do something if you're not part of that change or part of that growth and understanding the value and appreciation uh, for uh, DEI and for the multi faceted types of students and communities that are served by your institution. And the second uh, standard that CHIA has, of course we have 24, but the newest one is about innovation and sustainability. <laughs> you can't be more innovative than that. Sustainability education is a new way of thinking, a new way of connecting, a new way of creating, a new way of bringing people together for a common cause, and a new way of being passionate about that cause. And whatever needs to happen to support that is what Chia views as a very viable, sustainable program. So Chia has a very, very definitive value proposition around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I would encourage you all to look at chia.org 
and look at our diversity standard um, and our statement. We started off with a value. What is it that we value? If you don't value diversity, equity, and inclusion, if you don't value innovation, then you cannot support it. You cannot manifest it. You cannot integrate it. And so these are not constructs that are outside of the living education experience. The focus on innovation as a new process engage students in creative and progressive thinking. Um, how many times have you heard in higher education um, where students go into a class and they would say, oh, okay, I'm gonna hear a lecture. And then they walk out, out of that class and that's just what it was. There was no, there was no um, breathing it. There was no way that students could put into experience what that lecture was supposed to be for them. So thinking differently in higher education about how we teach, how we learn, how we experience our environment, how we sustain, how we be uh, not only committed, but responsible for our environment is innovation. And those are some of the, um, the, the practices that we encourage institutions to look at when they are thinking about innovative practices, not just technology, but all that encompasses a new way of being. So I, I certainly do think that there are opportunities for sustainable education programs uh, to be at the cutting edge. They are at the cutting edge of how we want a new community to look like, a community that thinks, as uh, I think I heard Becky or, or Alex say earlier, that thinks about the future. Yeah. Think about not just us, but who's going to be here for generations to come. So a holistic idea of teaching and learning through sustainable education is quite exciting. And accreditation is on the end of that but that doesn't mean that that's the end. Once these competencies and your programs and your faculty and your outcomes and your assessment systems are in place, then CHIA will absolutely welcome an application mm -hmm. for recognition from our accreditors who will be looking at these programs with new and engaging lights. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Jackson Hammond. I just really appreciate your comments and all the innovative thinking that I heard at the Chia conference. Um, and you know, it's not just sustainability education. This is really suffusing across all of higher education um, with other organizations and um, all universities. So it's uh, very exciting and comprehensive. Um, we lost our breakout room time, but uh, we can just open it up and talk with our panelists. I'm gonna take some of these pins off and we'll be able to see everybody. Uh, I know that a couple of the panelists might have to leave at the top of the hour. <clears throat> and um, I do promise that at tomorrow's round table, we will have breakout room. Um, we really want everybody to be able to talk and engage uh, with this great uh, mix of speakers. So if you have a question, you can put a question in the chat um, for any of the panelists in particular or in general, uh, or you can raise your Zoom hand and we'll just open it up. Uh, I know a few people will have to leave at the top of the hour. Um, but we will be here for an additional, we have an, 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 another 15 minutes um, to just open it up here for conversation. And again, thank you so much to all of the panelists for these really interesting thoughts. I'll start with what Kate put in the chat because I think it is an important question about undergraduate versus graduate. Um, you know, one of the things I've seen is that even in master's programs, 
unless you're really, especially in the early stages of our field in sustainability, unless you're really hustling and finding those applied experiences, there's a lot of people that went through the master's program at ASU in the first five, almost 10 years that are not in sustainability today. And they're not in sustainability today because they didn't get after it in grad school with applied experiences. And then they weren't able to develop a portfolio of skills and they didn't stay in the field. However, I remember very clearly uh, a professor and I got taken to lunch uh, at the end of working with an undergrad student for two years and the mother lambasted us. She's like, what is this future thinking? I mean, she knew the competencies because she her son had told them that. What, is, what did you teach my son? What did he do? Like, what did you do with his career? He got nothing out of this. And he's now had a 10-year career in sustainable mobility. He works for autonomous trucking companies. He's worked for three of them now. There's absolutely nothing he, else he could have done better to prepare for an emerging field that had no answers and had no solutions. And so I wouldn't put the undergraduate uh, programs off the hook. I think they can... I think they can do a lot to prepare students. And I think we're seeing students... Uh, go into some of these emerging fields, getting a lot out of the undergraduate sustainability program. So uh, it is a mixed bag uh, and we need to do better, but there can be really amazing outcomes from our programs, especially when it comes to what other program is going to prepare people for um, you know, these really emerging fields where there are very few answers and a lot of unknowns. Um, you know, there's a lot of promise there, I think. So just wanted to step in on that one. I want to follow up a little bit to Braden's, if that's okay. Um, yeah, well said, everybody. I keep saying well said in the chat, and I'm not just being kind. It just happens to be that you all are saying things very well. So, <laughs> but one thing I want to say here is I'm not a sustainability expert. I don't have any ambitions to be the expert inside an organization. I'm in HR. So, but I want to be an executive leader that supports, encourages, empowers, makes possible this work, advocates for it, pushes for it, brings leadership teams on site, et cetera. And so what we've not mentioned here, and I mentioned earlier in chat, which I think is worth underlining from my perspective, is um, the certificate programs, the short burst moments that matter where you're actually changing the way in which people think and feel and do but you're not asking them to be the expert. So that, at ASU, I'm just one of the few people in the world that didn't graduate from Arizona State University, I'm sorry to say, but I did go through one of their certificate programs, hugely helpful for me. I did this with Stanford too. So they had an intergenerational inclusive sustainability work they did um, for, uh, gosh, I can't remember who anyway, did that. That was like an eight hour course, got our leaders inside the organization to do that too, because what I really needed to do was I needed to shift their mind and their heart set to allow for expansive thinking toward this work so that when that person came in, they could be guided through it. Um, and so I just want to underline the critical nature of that type of accessible education for people who aren't going to be experts too. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Becky. Um, you know, we did hear a lot about ASU here, and that's because ASU was really um, first to have a sustainability degree program. So what we're seeing is kind of the maturation of that and what folks have done with those early sustainability degrees in the field and what we can learn <clears throat> about helping other universities to develop um, these sustainability degrees. There are something like 647 uh, sustainability degrees across the country. Most colleges and universities at this point have created something that draws on their um, faculty assets and their place where they are, um, have developed these sustainability degree programs. So we're trying to learn from uh, what ASU did and um, develop these across the country. And there's also um, other industry certifications and credentialing. We do have a speaker tomorrow who's going to talk about industry credentials. And I just want to um, flag a question that I saw in the chat. Um, Natalie, are you still here? Um, there was a question about ISSP 
uh, certification and other industry credentials? How, do, how can higher ed partner with industry credentials and ISSP? So um, Natalie, if you're here, you can unmute and ask your own question. Uh, I think it's a good one. And I'm also curious if any of the panelists have other credentials that have been helpful to you. Yes, hi, I'm still here. Um, yeah, I guess I that's I guess that's my question. I feel like um I teach a sustainability courses and a capstone course, and we have a lot of linkages with industry partners. And I so very much want to like uh, bridge that gap between what our industry partners need and in our kind of new sustainability major in my department. And so how can I, as an educator in academia, sort of better position myself to be able to teach students these these skills? So I, I do, yeah, I'm aware of the ISSP, the, and, you know, getting more information about ESGs in that kind of space. So I'm, there's so much. So, I, so any kind of input on that would be so helpful. Thank you. I can jump in and share a little bit from my experience during um, undergrad and grad school, I got accreditations in uh, LEAD, the Living Building Institute, GRI, SASB, kind of the whole acronym soup of uh, sustainability and ESG related um, programs. And beyond expanding my knowledge base, which is always helpful, right? Um, kind of to Bruno's point, being able to be a forager and know many things and be a, be a generalist, et cetera. Besides for that, honestly, they weren't as helpful as I was hoping they would be, especially for the price, um, because you do have to pay, right, for the testing. And then you also just have to spend an insane amount of time to learn all of those and be ready for those tests. Um, so personally, I think they would have been more valuable if maybe I took them through a university and there was an applied aspect to it. I know I'm, I'm very much on the applied theme, um, but if there was an opportunity to Put into practice what I learned in GRI training and SASB training, lead, etc. Then wow, then it becomes real and it becomes useful and tangible. Um, but I didn't, I didn't have that experience with the accreditation programs I took part in. Thanks, Alex. Um, Brian, I see your hand up. If you want to add to this, or if you have another question, go ahead. My name is Brian Levish. I'm a second year student in Leicester University in Kenya, Africa. Uh, I'm pleased to be, I guess, the youngest person in this meeting. This is my question. How can we integrate such courses as you partner with African academic institution? At least you're able to foster the vision 2030 as early as possible because we have seven years to go. And if we if we be doing this only for, for Europe and then Africa is just left behind because of the poor governance and and tribal clashes and politics, as young people, we are just tired by what our government is doing for us, for us young people. Now me being a student leader in our institution, how can we partner so that we're able to spread this hope and this space that youth are able to engage and create more space and to reduce the backlog of the of, of the UN Vision 2030. And also in that that same space, how we how how as institution are we creating space for our lecturers? Because I believe, and this is true, the the level of any academic institution depends on how the institution invests in the stakeholders. I, I mean, these are the workers, lecturers, and the, and the staffs, those who are in permanent and contract. How are you creating safe space, of, safe space for mental health for these leaders, for our lecturers? The, high, the highest number of people committing suicide are professionals. I find it partly lonely where uh, our lecturers go through things and they're not able to share with us as students because we are young people. It's like a mother and a son. They cannot discuss over marriage issues because I'm young. I'm not able to understand how we're creating such spaces for our, for our lecturers, for our professional space, for them to vent and to go home fresh and not to carry uh, academic or institutional wrangles to our family. 
where they're not able to balance? How are we able to bridge the gap of mental health, basing the fact that two years ago we had COVID, there are the opportunities that that were lost because of the technology, and now that the US is about to go for the election, they determine the policy, the whole world, the dynamics, the dollar, uh, the dollar versus the barrel, the oil and the dollar, oil and the minerals, the trade in the whole world, the economic diplomacy, it's affected by the level of US election. How are we able to cushion our, our professors and our professionals as we try to work on sustainability. Thank you, Brian. Uh, that I, I, there's a lot there. Um, I heard the, the global piece and how higher education is really, it's so place specific and yet it's also global um, and you know, universities need to be networked and and kind of work together on on some of this. And I also heard the mental health piece. Um, anybody feel able to respond to either the this global piece um, with Africa or the mental health piece that Brian's brought up? Yeah, Brian, I, I'll just I'll go ahead. Oh, Brian. oh, no, you go ahead, please. I was just going to say, I, I hear you and I, I feel you. I feel the same um, just, you know, personally about the intensity of working in this space. And I think everyone on this call knows what's at stake. Right. And it, it really weighs on all of us. Um, speaking for myself, there's days where it feels like an elephant is like sitting on my head and my heart. Right. Like, it's really hard. It's really hard stuff. And I think universities have to do a better job of supporting everyone who works there, studies there, engages there. Like, how can they be a leader on mental health for everyone that they touch um, through their work? So I, I agree with you. And I'm happy that you you raised that point. I don't have solutions, unfortunately. Um, but I, I just wanted to say I, I hear you and, and, and agree. Go ahead, Brayden. Oh, no, so well said, Alex. And, and that that emotional piece and what the the comment in the chat, I think, from Peter is really excellent there, too. Uh, Brian, I just want to also acknowledge the the first piece of your comment, which is, and I don't think it's a one-way street. I, 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 I really believe that we need to be doing a better job in terms of our academic institutions, uh, understanding how to support African universities, but also how to learn from African universities. I think there's so much around how we design a curriculum that allows this work to happen in very different economies and very different cultures and um and that finding ways to teach people how to do this work in a variety of contexts will make them better no matter where it is that they're working and so i i some of the uh students that i've gotten to work with over the years i've gotten to work with many students from all over the world and including from africa who are very passionate about how do I bring knowledge that I'm learning from an American university back home? And then and then I've often found that they're actually bringing a lot to the table that American students and American professors can learn from. So it's a huge area. I don't have a solution for it, but I do think that if, I do think that it's very possible that a lot of American universities will create this very sort of it's a tough thing because we're saying American universities, you got to do better in your backyard because most of you suck at engagement in your own backyard, but you also need to be preparing global leaders and doing a better job preparing people that are able to do this work anywhere in the world. So it's tough because I don't think universities are doing what either particularly well, and, but we need to figure out how to support universities in doing both better. I think also I might say just the provocative question matters too, Brian. You know, sometimes there's not answers on this call, but when you throw in a question like that to a group of educators and administrators and leaders like this, and then they start to think, huh, I wonder what we actually do, right? So I, I think even just even just coming with an, an intensely important question is, is part of the work of progress, if that makes sense too. Um, and then I just want to say one thing about Peter's 
uh, Peter's post or Peter's question. Thanks for that, which is now trending. It's gone viral. Many people are liking this, Peter. So, so well mm -hmm. done you. Um, but I think that you need to bring in leaders into the education organization in particular HR senior leadership teams. I'm a little bit biased. I'm like, bring me into your, into your uh, organization. I'll tell them what's up. No, but, um, and it, because well, listen, the job of an of higher ed or any education organization is to prepare children, to prepare adults, to be able to be competent, capable, hopefully feel kind of good and excited about the working world. And so you got to talk to the working world and say, hey, working world, what is it that you would like? So I think that if you're trying to influence people on your leadership team inside your organization, bring in leaders from some of these companies and say, what are the competencies that you really need? They will no doubt talk about that emotional resilience, that storytelling, that empathy, that, and you can certainly prime that too in advance. But I think hearing directly from them um, really matters. And last thing I'll say here, if so many things we learned from the pandemic, but one of the things that, that HR in particular has learned generally even beyond this work is the emotional resilience of employees being so important. So this is no longer a foreign concept that they cannot grapple with um, and they and they know it even more inside this fear-based work or, or fear-motivated work. So much to all of our panelists. Uh, just to, again, sort of reiterate some of our next steps. We mentioned several times this um, proposal statement on key competencies in sustainability. Uh, we'll be sure that you get the link. It is available on the website. Anyone can read and respond to this survey. Um, and we encourage you to do so in this extended peer review period. Some of our other next steps and ways to participate. Uh, the GCSE member community has a monthly community of practice meeting where, again, we really get into um, the details and the nitty gritty of this work. Uh, and we love to welcome uh, GCSE members there. We will be hosting and planning another uh, big round table like this. And the topic is going to be climate justice and really looking at the, the whole justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion issue with sustainability degree programs and sustainability jobs. So that will be coming up. Um, we're thinking about um, either joining or convening or somehow getting a mechanism for consistent input from uh, the workforce, from some of the types of employers that we had here with us today. I'm thinking in my mind about uh, Deb's advice, like don't do a new thing, uh, you know, get a regional type of, of input. So um, I'm already processing uh, the advice that I heard today. Uh, but we do want to keep this door open with um, with workforce, with employers, with all the stakeholders in this idea of a program level accreditation. We're working also with ASHI, with uh, ACE, which which is uh, the Association for Environmental Studies and Sciences. Um, you know, we are collaborating. There's a lot going on right now, and we're really interested in convening, collaborating, and doing what we can to strengthen and improve sustainability uh, and sustainability-related degrees and certificates. We are at exactly 12.15, so thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Really appreciate each and every one of you and the time that you've shared today. Thank you so much. Great session. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you, Thank you, Krista. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Give them, Krista. Give them. Good job, Krista. My team. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Good job, Alex. Alex, you were awesome. It's good to see you. Oh, sure. Always, anytime. I'm off now. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Terry. Thanks for coming to both. Oh, it was good. It was such a nice mix of different folks and different perspectives. So I thought it was well done. Um, take care. Until next time. Bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs> That's it. Thank you for taking notes. I I I, this is, I couldn't have
Oh. Yep. The next, the, <laughs> next, the next step will be, you know, to edit the video, consolidate the notes, organize, right? That's going to be lots of fun. That reminds me.